This program is made by MPT to enrich the diverse communities throughout our state and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Baltimore born and raised, David Rubenstein is an author, television host, legendary businessman, and philanthropist, a co-founder of the Carlisle Group. His rise from a student at Baltimore's City College to White House aide to billionaire global investor took patience, hard work, and a dash of good luck. I'm Mike Gill, former Secretary of Commerce for the state of Maryland. Join me as we discuss David Rubenstein's upbringing in Charm City, his search for the right career, and the keys to his success. All coming up next. Beautifully set on the Chesapeake Bay, Maryland's capital city of Annapolis contains 400 years of history. And it was at Maryland's historic state house where I greeted David Rubenstein. David's love of history is well documented and can be experienced with him on his public television series, History with David Rubenstein where he interviews people from presidential historians to Pulitzer Prize-winning authors with an informed enthusiasm. With that in mind, I was thrilled to bring him inside an historically significant place he had never seen, the Annapolis State House's old Senate chamber. Here, George Washington once stood before Congress to submit his letter of resignation from the Continental Army in 1783. An avid collector of historical artifacts, David owns one of the surviving copies of the Magna Carta, which is exhibited at the National Archives, as well as two copies of the Emancipation Proclamation, currently displayed at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. His philanthropic efforts have also included the preservation of the Washington Monument and Lincoln Memorial. Surrounded by all this history, there was no better place to find out how this kid from Baltimore has accomplished so much and has had so much positive impact on our country. David, welcome to Annapolis. Welcome to the State House. Thank you for being here with me. My pleasure to be here. It's an historic place, and I like to be at historic places. So let's go to Baltimore. Let's let's talk about Baltimore and then uh, move on from there. Uh, And when I talked to you yesterday and we got ready for this interview, I said to you, you know, David, if I had a title for it, let's just call it Two Kids from Baltimore because our roots uh, have more similarities and dissimilarities. Well, Baltimore is a very unusual city. Uh, it's a family-oriented city when I was growing up. Yep. And it had very much uh, a demarcation between people who were Italian, they were Greek, they were Jewish, they were black, they were Protestant. And people tended to live in these uh, subgroups, I get. And and there was big high schools that brought people together. So Baltimore City College, Baltimore Polytechnic brought men together and from all parts of the city. It was very unusual. But I found over the years, now some 50 years later, that whenever you meet somebody from Baltimore, one of the first questions is, where did you go to high school? (laughs) Because people can judge you about what what you're like or something about your background by where you went to high school. So people still ask me when I say I'm from Baltimore, what high school did you go to? And I ask people the same. Well, you know, David, knowing that uh, you grew up in the Falstaff area, um, let's go back to just childhood. I know you're a single child, tremendous mom, tremendous dad. Can you talk about your parents and and those memories that just will always be there for you? Well, Baltimore was a place that was rigidly segregated by religion. Yes. Uh, And if you were Jewish, you weren't allowed to own homes in certain places. So the Jewish community basically moved to Northwest Baltimore. And there were three types of people in the Jewish community, as I recall those who were entrepreneurs or business people that had a fair amount of money, those who were, I'd say, civil servants or had nice professional jobs, and then there were people who were blue-collar workers, and my father was a blue-collar worker. He had worked uh, in the post office his yep. entire life. He dropped out of high school to go into World War II, never came back to finish high school. My mother also didn't finish high school. They married when they were very young, but seems to me incredibly young, 21 for him and 17 for her, and I, uh, I was their only child. But you know, it's an interesting thing. When you grow up without a lot of money, you don't really feel that you are uh, in, in unfortunate. You just take the circumstances you find yourself in and you make the best of it. In hindsight, growing up without a lot of money was a, a big advantage because I knew if I did anything, I had to do it on my own. And if I got something that happened that was good, people would say, well, you did it because you worked hard and so forth. If you grow up in a wealthy family and you succeed, well, you're 
I mean, people are going to say, well, your father was wealthy, he helped you, and so forth. So in the end, it was a big advantage. And also, you knew you had to do something on your own. Now, I know, I know you skipped the eighth grade. Uh, somebody told me that. Was that a good idea? It was a terrible idea. Um, in sixth grade, they gave you some tests. So anybody who's listening that has a chance to skip the eighth grade, stay. I, I agree. The Baltimore had a program then that if you were in the sixth grade and you passed some test, uh, which I guess I must have passed, you could go into a program where you, in effect, skip the eighth grade because junior high school was only two years. But the da downside of that is you're with the rest of your life people who are a year older than you. Yeah. So I graduated from uh, City College when I was 16 years old, probably a little bit young to go to college, maybe a year, year and a half younger. And so I didn't know it at the time. My parents were proud I got into a special program. But in hindsight, it wasn't a good thing in my view. <laughs> Well, you went to City, um, and I remember because I was at Calvert Hall the same time you were at City. There was no more prestigious public high school in America than Baltimore City College. It was the it was known as the as the school of judges, and mayors, and governors, and doctors, and lawyers, and future private equity executives. Actually, they probably didn't have any private equity executives yet, did they? And a lot of distinguished graduates. Uh, the school was started in 1839. It's the third oldest public high school in the country. And it was a melting pot because people from all over the city would go there if they weren't going to be engineers. If they wanted to be engineers, they would go to poly. So you had incredibly talented people. Some, some of the yeah. most famous writers or, or government officials uh, came from there. And so it was quite an quite a impressive place to go. Uh, to get there, I had to take a bus uh, from, you know, and then transfer, some was of it you the may seven? remember. Did you take, take the, the seven? seven and transfer to the 22. <laughs> and so it was an hour each way. It wasn't Abe Lincoln walking to school necessarily, but, you know, it's an hour each way out of your life each way uh, each day. But anyway, I enjoyed it. Uh, city was then very crowded, uh, City College, and so we had shifts. And so you went from 8 to 12, as I recall, and then from 1 to 5, I think it was. So I was only in school for you know, half a day, usually, and then you had time for extracurriculars or whatever else you wanted to do. How about favorite teacher? Did you have one at City? Is there, is there a person who, who left a, an impression, left, uh, added something to your life after City? that you always remember? I think everybody has one or more teachers that have made an impression. There was a very famous teacher at Baltimore City College who was an English teacher. His name was John Pence. And he was really good at teaching people how to write. And to the extent that I know how to write at all, it's because he really drilled into me and my classmates how you have to actually have to write things in the English language in a certain way. So if there's one teacher that was really helpful to me, it was John Pence. Yeah, and, uh, and I know you're... Uh can your uh, commitment to literacy, it's something that keeps you up. You're passionate about literacy and because and, and, it's slipping. It's, it's, it's not the way it was when John Pence was teaching at City College. Literacy is a very important thing to me. I got my uh, Enoch Pratt library card when I was six years old. You could take out 12 books a week and I took them out. I'd read them that week and then I had to wait a week before I could get 12 more. I love reading because it gave me a whole new uh, perspective on the world than I had in my little cloistered uh, uh, group that I was growing up in, the neighborhood I was growing up, growing up in. So I really loved reading, and I, today I'm still an avid reader. Uh, with respect to literacy, it's been important to me because I think if I hadn't been literate and I hadn't read a lot, I would not have been able to do some of the things I've done. But it's sad that 14% yeah, yeah. of adults in this country are functionally illiterate, which means they can't read past the fourth grade level. And a large percentage of people who can read are illiterate, which is to say they don't choose to read. So 30% of all the people that have graduated from college in this country have not read a book in the last five years. And that's because they say, well, I graduated and I, I don't have to read anymore. But the truth is you have to keep reading. You have to exercise your brain. It's a muscle. It has to be exercised. And you really have to keep reading and reading and reading. And reading books is more important than reading anything else because it focuses the brain much more than reading a magazine article or, or a tweet does. Hey, last thing about Baltimore City College. You were a member of the Lancers Boys Club. Right. And, and our good friend and the future mayor, Kurt Schmoke, was... What were your memories of the Lancers Boys Club? Well, Lancers and, Boys... And maybe that trip. The Lancers Boys Club was started in the 1950s, really, by Bob Hammerman, who later became a judge and served, I think, as a judge longer than anybody else who ever served as a judge in, in Baltimore City. 
And he basically devoted his life to this boys club. Initially, it was for Jewish boys, but then it expanded, and it was all boys all over the city, and then later, boys and girls. Um, But it was a place where you learn how to play sports, and you learn about intellectual things as well, and very talented people like Kurt Schmoke were members of it. So I still stay in touch with them, and Kurt and I and some of the others, we we gather from time to time uh, to talk about how great we were when we were (laughs) 14 years old. Hey, let's uh, let's leave uh, 33rd Street. And, uh, and head to Durham, North Carolina. How'd you go to Duke? Well, I was an equal opportunity applier for scholarships. Whoever gave me the biggest scholarship, that's where I went. My parents didn't have a lot of money, so yeah. I kept telling my parents, don't worry, they'll give me a scholarship. So Duke gave me the biggest scholarship, and that's where I went. I had never been there, and I only filled out the application the day before it was due, and I wasn't sure I would get in because I didn't have a typewriter, so I wrote it out in longhand, and my handwriting is very bad. I wasn't sure that I would get accepted because they couldn't read my handwriting, but actually maybe because they couldn't read my handwriting, they accepted me. They thought I had better answers to the questions than I really did. So I went there, and I would say it was a different university. I later became chairman of the board of the university, but at the time that I went there, it was a fairly cloistered university. It had been, de- it had been segregated until 1963 for undergraduates, and it had a Jewish quota that I didn't know at the time, about 5%, which was not uncommon in a lot of uh, good schools. So it was a different school. Yeah. Today, it's a, it's a global university and one of the best colleges and universities in the United States, for sure. Then it was more of a southeastern university, more regional than it, than it turned out to be later on. You, uh, you go to the University of Chicago School of Law, you're president of the Law Review. You get, a, you get a great job, Paul Weiss in New York. And then shortly thereafter, you went down to Washington to take that position in 75 as chief counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, what was it? What, what pulled you to Washington at that point? I was interested in politics and uh government when I was growing up, there were no private equity firms, there were no hedge funds, there were no tech startups. It was a different world. So if you grew up in Baltimore, um, you're Jewish, you might want to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I didn't want to be a doctor. I wasn't that good in the sciences. I figured I was better at maybe talking or writing, so I'd be a lawyer. But I was really interested in politics. And so that was my first love. And so I went to work at Paul Weiss because Ted Sorensen had been there and was there. Yep. Ted Sorensen was the great speechwriter for for President Kennedy. Yep. And so I thought I could maybe get some of his uh, gold dust kind of sprinkled on me, and I'd be I'd get a job in the White House someday, as he had done. And he did help me get a job with Birch Bayh, and that led me ultimately to uh, working in a, in, in for Jimmy Carter in the campaign. And when Carter got elected in 1976, as most people get elected president do, they say, well, okay, people work in the campaign, you should work in the administration. So I didn't really know Carter, but my boss was close to him, and I got a job in the White House, and I was only 27 years old. You've got a big title. You're hanging out with the President of the United States with a title that needed a business card this big. Assistant Uh, Director to the President. I was the Deputy Assistant to the President for Domestic Policy. Um, I didn't really know Carter uh, because I had not really met him in the campaign. He was out campaigning. I'm working in Atlanta. Um, I didn't meet him probably for two weeks into the the White House. And, uh, you know, he ultimately, uh, he liked uh, my boss a lot, and I did some work for my boss, and ultimately the President Carter got to know me. But you can think about it. My parents were blue-collar workers. Um, I'm their only child, and you know, a couple months after Carter is elected uh, and becomes president, I'm walking out of the Oval Office on the South Lawn just with Carter and me and the Secret Service getting on Marine One to go to Camp David or go on some trip. So they were there sometimes, and they would see it, and they would say, how did this happen? So and I was saying the same thing. You know, it's, it's very... Um, important to not let yourself get too full of yourself when you work at the White House. It's a very temporary thing. You're there for four years or eight years or maybe, you know, a very shorter period of time than that. And sure enough, we lost the election, so my job is gone. So one day I'm at the White House, I'm on Air Force One, Marine One, going to Camp David. The next day I'm unemployed. And, you know, you find then uh, that people tell you how (laughs) great you are when you're at the White House, they want something from you, you can't get them on the phone again. So it's a learning experience that was useful for me. Did you have a plan B? or you had to scramble pretty quickly to figure out plan B. Did you think about coming home and maybe running for mayor or something like that? There was no... Uh, was, that in the, was that in the possibility? I didn't see any groundswell of support for somebody who worked in the Carter White House coming back to run for mayor, no. I, I think somebody who worked on our staff did come back with that idea. His name was Kurt Schmoke, and obviously he was elected three terms as mayor. No, uh, my plan B was to get a job practicing law. But the problem was that people didn't want to hire Carter White House aides when Reagan was president, and I was still very young, and he hadn't practiced law very much. 
So it wasn't as if people were knocking down the door to say, please come in. But I didn't want to tell my mother that her only child was unemployed and unemployable. So I kept saying, well, the reason I haven't taken a job is I have so many offers, I don't know which one to pick. So this went on from January, February, March, April, May, June. My mother said, finally, take some offer, take something, go back to work. But <laughs> finally, somebody came through with something, uh, and I got a job in June. I started practicing law again. But then the great realization came. With the came. Shaw Pittman. I did. A, yep. a very nice yep. firm in Washington. Yep. But I realized relatively quickly, as my partners and clients did, that I wasn't a good lawyer. And that's an advantage. See, if I had been a very good lawyer, I'd be practicing law still, and maybe that's okay, but I, I wouldn't have enjoyed it that much. And so I realized I wasn't that good at this, and so, and I didn't enjoy it. And I tell people, young people all the time, find something that you enjoy, because nobody ever won a Nobel Prize hating what they do. You have to love what you're doing, and you have to be pretty good at it. Let, let, let's go to what I think is the most exciting story. You know, coming from a business background, the Carlisle Group, uh, it's 1987. You know, David, usually if a story starts something like this, there's a, a Jewish fella and an Italian fella and an Irish fella, you know, usually the next part of the punchline is a rabbi and a priest. But in this case, there was a Jewish fella, and an Italian fella, and an Irish fella that started something called the Carlisle Group. Well, I wanted to start a private equity firm in Washington, which didn't exist before there had been no private equity firms. And and so I was looking for people, and everybody I talked to said, David, you have no experience, you have no money, you have no knowledge to buy out business, thank you very much. In fact, I went to see a, a young woman who had become the treasurer of Gannett. Her name was Gracia Martori. And I said, I'd like you to join, we're starting a firm, you're very credible, and she said, wait a second, you have no money, you've never worked together with anybody that's been in buyouts, you don't have to do buyouts, and why would I leave my career? No, but as I was leaving, the door uh, in her office, she said, by the way, there's a guy named Bill Conway who's the treasurer and CFO of uh, MCI, a telecommunications yeah. company. I think he might be leaving, give him a call. So I gave him a cold call, and like a lot of cold calls, uh, you expect nothing will really happen, but Bill agreed to have lunch with me, and ultimately we recruited him, and ultimately he became one of the best private equity investors of the last 30 years. Uh, and now you're on the search for the, the finance guy, and you had uh, raised five, well, five million was the number to get the, uh, Carlisle off the ground. So you find a fella, Dan Danello, who was at the Marriott Corporation, big job, and he loved it. He was going to, he quit. Mr. Marriott tried to talk him into staying, but he quit. And then I've heard he came to, he came in to see you and Bill. He's all excited. And he said, well, let's go. We got the five million, right? And you said, uh, well, we still got to raise it. He said, wait a minute. I thought you had the five million. Is there any truth to that one? Well, it's pretty much true what you just said. Um, we <laughs> meant to say to him we were going to get the five million. Maybe he didn't hear that quite uh, as clearly <laughs> as we would have liked. Yes. And uh, then actually, it, uh, it, because of our Baltimore connection, uh, really, or my Baltimore connection, we raised the money. What happened was somebody I'd met when I was in the White House who was working at T. Rowe Price, Ed Mathias, he said, I'll help you raise the money. And he introduced us to four investors, two of whom were based in Baltimore. Uh, one of them was T. Rowe. T. Rowe Price and the other was Alex Brown, and they became our, our investors. So we started with $5 million. Now the firm has about $250 billion or so. So it worked out pretty well. Oh, yeah, and 1,700 team members and 31-plus countries. And, and, uh, and I know one thing I've heard in your interviews you're so proud of is the distributions. We've, we've made uh, in profits uh, well over $100 billion for our investors, well over $100 billion for Fabulous. our investors. So well, it's been a good story, but we got lucky and we, we made some mistakes. We could have done a lot yeah. of things better. And I think back on all the deals that we didn't do that we should have done <laughs> and all the mistakes we made. So when I talk about what we've done at Carlisle over the last 30 years, I like to talk about the mistakes that we've made because they're the ones that drive me crazy. Well, you know, we could probably do a multi-part series and just talk about the mistakes, right? Because if you, you got to get up the bat. I, mean, I know. Look, that, uh, you can't when, hit home runs until you get in the... We helped, the uh, box. we helped, uh, in a way, Jeff Bezos start Amazon with uh, giving him a yeah. bibliography of books in print, and we got some stock, but we sold it at the IPO. It's probably worth $20 billion today. Um, I had a chance to invest in Mark Zuckerberg's company when he was in still at Harvard, and I turned it down thinking he wouldn't get anywhere. Um, so many times I made big mistakes. Now, David, I know what you brought to the team, um, meaning that Bill was the uh, analyst and extraordinary Dan was extraordinary on the finance things, and you became the guru of fundraising. Just, 
how'd you, where'd you learn how to sell? Did you, did you go take a Carnegie course or how did that happen? Well, um, in any, I heard you were, you were a superstar selling. Well, in any organization, you have to figure out what you're going to do to make yourself useful. Otherwise, there's no point in being there. Even if you're the founder of the firm, people would say, well, what are you doing here? So I had to figure out what can I do. I didn't really have finance skills. I didn't have the kind of skills that Dan and Bill had. So I said, OK, I'll go out and raise the money. So I wasn't a back-slapping, uh, cigar-chomping, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, you know suspender-wearing kind of guy who was playing golf every weekend with prospective investors. I was just the guy that, you know, knew something about Washington and, and, and maybe could talk okay. So I just started meeting with people around the world, and I would spend 200 plus days, maybe 240 days around the world traveling and meeting with prospective investors. So we built a very large fundraising base. I would say uh, I, I did learn how to be a fundraiser, and it was something that, a skill that I didn't think I would have. I didn't go to law school to do yeah. it. And I, I think about it, and you would know as your own background, um, Nobody really takes a course in fundraising. They don't teach it at Harvard Business School or Stanford Business School or the equivalent, but actually most people spend half their life either being solicited for something or another or soliciting other people yeah. for, for charitable contributions, political contributions, or investment contributions or investments. So um, it's a skill that more people probably should think about. David, I brought, I brought one of my favorite, favorite new books. It sits there by the bed stand. And what I'd love to talk to you about for the next few minutes is leadership. You have, you have interviewed, somebody's probably counted it up, hundreds of people. It, it's a lot of people. What are the common, the more common characteristics that you've observed with great leaders? Because there's some that probably are consistently across the board. Well, all leaders have luck. Uh, it just don't become a leader from day one. You have to have some luck. You have to have somebody that nurtures yep. you. Yep. You have to have somebody that introduces you to somebody, a certain circumstance happens, so there's luck. Secondly, there's failure. Nobody goes from the beginning of their life to the top without any failures. There's always setbacks, and setbacks help you because you learn from them. And then there's persistence. Everybody's persistent. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, people told them those ideas wouldn't work, but they persisted. The same is true in politics or in business or in, in any area of life. You gotta persist. I also think there's a certain amount of humility that works. Um, I think there's always leaders we'll know about. Napoleon wasn't exactly a humble person, I think. But uh, I think most leaders today, the ones you admire or, or you should admire, have a certain amount of humility because they realize they had luck. If you could sit with Warren Buffett for days and he wouldn't tell you how wealthy he is, uh, you could sit with, Warren, with Bill Gates for a long time and he's not going to tell you how smart he is. You know, you can observe that. But you can see that these are people that don't brag about what they've done. They just kind of move forward and they have a certain amount of humility. I also think it takes the ability to communicate with people. You can't be a leader if you don't have followers. And you have to get followers by communicating with them, either orally or writing or things yep. like that, yep. so, or leading by example. George Washington, as we sit in this room, George Washington's statue is right over there. When he was in Valley Forge in 1777, he could have gone down to the Ritz-Carlton or the Four Seasons and not stayed with his troops. He could have afforded that, but he didn't do that. He stayed with his troops because he wanted to lead by example. He wanted to say, I'm with you. So, so I've heard you're a, uh, a, an, an angler, a fisherman. So if you're going to charter a nice boat to, take, to go out in the Chesapeake Bay, any three people from all of history, from any walk of life, politics, business, religion, sports, name three people that you might want to call up and say, Hey, you want to go fishing? I think it's be more interesting, I guess, uh, to get people that uh, are not alive anymore. I would love, wish, love to spend some time with, you know, William Shakespeare or Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. I wish someday we could figure out a way to kind of uh, do something with them that uh, we can't do now. Now, think about this. The interview format we have now, it's a relatively new format where somebody interviews somebody else and you watch it for information and entertainment. We didn't have that with Shakespeare or with uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. They were never interviewed. So it'd be wonderful at some time if we could figure out a way to interview them and get the answers they would have given. So maybe then we could work on that. You may have already said it earlier, but best advice you ever got from your parents? Best advice. Best advice from my parents is uh, do the best you can and we still will love you no matter what happens. And so they didn't put pressure on me to, to do anything, but they just, they, they always made it clear they would support whatever I wanted to do. Great. We're, uh, we're uh, winding down now, David, and this has been fabulous to be with you. We just have a few more minutes. So if we're on a plane, everybody's got their seatbelts fastened and the trays are up and we can, we can see the runway. Um, next 50 years, 
So that's what we're going to uh, talk about for just a few more minutes, the next 50 years. And, and you said to Oprah in the interview, which was awesome, by the way, you said to her something like, why don't you slow up? So let me ask you the question. Why don't you slow up? Well, because everything I'm doing now, I enjoy. So I wouldn't want to slow well, up. If you because... stop enjoying it, you'll slow up. Well, if I, well, I wouldn't enjoy <laughs> playing shuffleboard or something like that, so I enjoy what I'm doing. I also think if you keep active physically and mentally, it enables you to live longer. And so that's what presumably most people want to do. And so I love what I'm doing. I just wish I had more time in the day. And I do find as you get older, you can't probably work quite at the pace you did when you were 20 years younger, but I'm doing the best I can, and I, I love what I'm doing. If I could give you one mulligan, I'm not going to give you like three or four. I'm only going to give you one mulligan so far. Now, the next 71 years of your life, I'll, it, I'll, I could give you another mulligan, but for the first 71, I'm going to give you a mulligan. Is there anything that you want to use it for over this first that you want to do different? So if you could rewrite something, anything sticking out? Well, there's always a tendency that I have to look back and think of all the things I could have done better. Yep. Um, but right now, I'm reasonably happy with where I am. I just hope that I can live long enough time to give away my money in a productive way to say thank you to the country for my good fortune and to live to see um, healthy and happy children and grandchildren uh, you know, do things that they, they want to do with their lives. Yeah. David, thank you. It's been an incredible uh, time with you, and I'm so glad to have my gotten pleasure. to know you. My pleasure. Happy to be here. It's a great historic setting. I want to thank everybody that made it possible. And Thank you, thank George you. Washington. He, he listened to the whole thing. He's um, probably going to critique it. He probably will. <laughs> but thank you very much.